Motor Ring 2008 on TSN is brought to you by the new Q Horsepower from Quaker State. Unleash all your horses. And Michelin, a better way forward. You know, Arizona is a favorite place for car manufacturers to launch new vehicles for obvious reasons. It's always sunny in Arizona, right? Wrong. It hasn't rained in Arizona the entire year until we arrive. We're in the beautiful Red Rock, Sedona area, and it hasn't stopped raining all day. Now, we're here because this is a spot that Nissan picked. Now, you think Nissan might be a little upset about all this wet stuff, but you know what? They've got lots to smile about. All their vehicles are selling well, led by the new Versa, which at this time is actually outselling the Honda Fit and the Toyota Yaris. But I digress. We are here to check out the second generation Nissan Murano. We introduced the Murano originally in 2003 as an 04 model, and what we saw evolving in the utility segment was customers that were looking for something that was more sophisticated, uh, had more design, but still offered them all the utility and value that they wanted. And when we saw that opportunity, we thought, you know, we can do something that can really fulfill that need. And that was the original Murano. Now we're to the second generation Murano, and uh, we've just simply evolved that. I mean, we've just made it that much better. We wanted to make it more stylish, we, but not making it silly or really going overboard. Very clean lines, new grille, new hood. There's a really good flow from the hood through to the back of the vehicle, strong character lines on the side of the vehicle, and very strong wheel arches. Uh, those give the vehicle presence on the road and they kind of anchor it to the road and that really helps in terms of uh, the utility side of uh, what a Murano is all about. The window line is almost identical and the front end I'm not entirely sure on yet. It's growing on me though. Well, um, they've, they've taken uh, the lamps that used to go over the fenders in the front and in the back, and they've, they've made it so they go around the sides now. The rear looks uh, a lot like the Rogue, actually. Uh, the front, I don't know, the, the light set's just, it's different. Uh, it's the best I can say about it. You know, Nissan really wanted to make the Murano a vehicle you'd like to sit in for long periods of time, and they nailed it. Extremely comfortable. Now, you got to hand it to these car companies, right? I mean, they call the first row the living room. The second row, the reception area, and the cargo area, the hobby area. Whatever, but I'll tell you one thing, there's some neat things back here. Both these seats will pop down, and then they power up. Straight up like that, you gotta keep your finger on it. But anyway, another cool thing is, you know, you come back with groceries and you put them in the back, and you know, by the time you get home, the oranges and the eggs and everything's all over the place, they thought of that too. Just press the button, this beautiful divided little storage area comes up. All-wheel drive is standard on this vehicle. We think that's the right thing for our market. Um, this is an, an evolution of our all-wheel drive system as well. We call it intuitive all-wheel drive. And unlike other all-wheel drive systems that kind of wait for a wheel to slip or something like that, this vehicle is anticipating what you may need. So with throttle input, steering wheel input, there's a G sensor built into it, there's a yaw sensor which detects motion of the vehicle from side to side. So it's not waiting for the car to start to slip. In other words, maybe you've gone too far, it's already anticipating the need for all-wheel drive. So again, it gives a very stable, very comfortable kind of feel to the vehicle. You know, the 2009 Nissan Murano comes with a CVT, or Continuously Variable Transmission. Now, this technology isn't new, but Nissan is really now committing to it on most of their models. And the question is, why? Well, the original Murano was the first time we'd used a CVT in a, in a vehicle in North America, although we've had experience with CVT for many years. People really like it. It's a very fuel-efficient transmission. It's a very smooth and responsive transmission, and it provides great uh, cruising on the highway, very low RPM and very quiet. What we've done with that CVT is simply evolve it to what we call the S-CVT. And um, the benefit that we give customers is really in the tuning of this transmission. Uh, CVTs can be electronically controlled much more than a stepped transmission, a normal automatic. So in, in designing the software that controls the transmission, you can really make it react to the way the consumer wants to drive as much as to the way they are driving. Provides a better feel, provides better fuel efficiency, and makes the vehicle even more fun to drive. Well, the new one obviously builds on the success of the past one. The interior is uh, probably where the biggest difference is. It's, it's much nicer, better use of materials that are soft to the touch, and you know the overall design is a lot more cohesive. Um, 
you know, brings it forward in the same way that the redesign of the Ultima did with that vehicle. No coincidence, I guess, same, same platform. The you know, Omorana was all about a super evolution of this vehicle and being very intelligent about what, uh, what you want to provide this customer. This is a very discerning customer, so we know that, uh, that they're going to be challenging us a little bit. To, did we really satisfy them? And we think we will. Have you ever heard of Ruben Smead? Well, he's never heard of you either. More later on Kenzie's Corner. On this edition of Test Drive, the Suzuki SX4 sedan. It's a little car, but it's got a surprising punch. The SX4 sedan continues to take Suzuki closer to the mainstream market and for several reasons. First, the styling is perky and nowhere near as quirky as Suzuki's of yesteryear, and it also has the size needed to compete with its key competition. It is 4,490 millimeters long, 1730 wide, and it rides on a longish 2,500 mil wheelbase. It used to be if you bought a small car, you got a small back seat. This Suzuki SX4 is surprisingly roomy. There's enough space under the seat for your feet, there's plenty of knee room, and enough headroom for a six footer. There's also enough width to accommodate three people as long as they are real good friends. You wouldn't want to do it for a long time, but for a short time, it's just fine. Power comes from a two liter four cylinder engine that puts 143 horsepower and 136 pound feet of torque at the driver's disposal. It is strong enough to be fun and so delivers a decent turn of speed off the line. More impressive is what happens in the mid range. Nail the gas and the four speed automatic drops a cog quickly as the engine delivers on the demand without getting noisy. It also retains this unexpected composure right the way to redline. At this end of the market, it is one of the better mills. Slip behind the wheel of this SX4 and you will not be disappointed. To begin with, nice materials and this simple splash of brushed aluminum, it brightens an otherwise black interior. You'll also find comfortable seats, power locks, windows and mirrors, cruise control that sits on the steering wheel where it should, decent audio system. The other thing you'll find, automatic climate control. Now that's something you expect to find on more expensive cars. When it comes to ride and handling, the SX4 is both comfortable and sharp. When pressed through the pylons, the suspension takes a predictable set and rides the run out with little drama. It also has decent lateral grip thanks to the Sport's oversized P205 50R17 tires. This also means that the steering has a connected feel and an eager response to driver input. Perhaps the one place Suzuki has to be taken to task is found right back here. There are a couple of quibbles. Now, whilst the opening is large and the capacity is generous, there are no 60-40 split folding rear seats. That means what you see is what you get. The other problem, well, when you come back to the car with an armload of groceries, you've got to put them down to use the key or to go inside and use the remote inside. Now, this thing needs one of two things. A button on this remote that would pop the trunk or a handle right here. Better yet, why not both? The standard anti-lock brakes boast a crisp pedal feel and even after several full-on stops, fade-free performance. The credit here goes to the four-wheel discs and the fact they're only slowing 1,245 kilograms of automobile. The rest of the safety necessities are also in place. Along with dual-stage front bags come side seat-mounted airbags and drop-down side curtains as well as seatbelt pretensioners. The only wish? Well, it's for the SX4 hatchback's optional all-wheel drive system. At two grand, it's a steal and well worth the money. This little SX4 sedan is a fun package and it boils down to a number of things. First of all, plenty of power, it's comfortable and it handles very well thanks to these 17 inch wheels. However, that only scratches the surface. It's most likable trait, you get a lot more than you expect for a lot less than you expect. Oh my 
my glass and see who's in here tonight. Straight up, but that could reason make me ill. And if someone touch my fever skin, I get mad enough to kill. Ladies and gentlemen, the revolutionary Audi R8 V12 TDI concept, a diesel powered super sports car. 500 horsepower and 1,000 Newton meters of torque. So you really can have incredible performance, but at the same time, get in US EPA figures, 24 miles per gallon city. Think about that in a supercar. For customers, this means up to 34 miles of all electric, emissions-free driving. I think this is another demonstration of our strong commitment to develop vehicles that lower our dependence on petroleum. We're all looking for solutions, and part of the reason we're looking for it is not just for green. Everyone says they're looking for green, but what they also want to do is find competition for oil. The United States is using 4,600 gallons of gasoline a second. We are 96% dependent on gasoline. We have to diversify. As world leaders, we have the technology, we are developing the technology, and we have the ability and the science to be self-sufficient, but now we need the will. Ladies and gentlemen, the Cadillac CTS Coupe concept. How can we do a real kick-ass coupe that looks really hot, sexy, has all the Cadillac cues with the, with the creases and the edges, this diamond cut rear end with the vertical tail lamps, all those elements really help to make it a Cadillac. I'd like to think 90% of what you see here, you're gonna see soon. What a difference a year makes. A lot of hard work around the world is really starting to pay off. We're seeing rapid growth in Asia, our new small cars in Europe are setting the standard, and our profits in South America are very strong. I'm impressed with Ford's new product. Um, the Verve, the Explorer America concept, will it get here soon enough? But more troubling is their almost evangelical approach that there's nothing wrong with Ford right now. It's, I keep looking for Jim Jones, the Kool-Aid, and, and, and exiting the door of, of the stand before I'm, I'm poisoned with arsenic, you know? I mean, it's, it's very bizarre. They, there's absolutely no admission, seemingly, that there's anything wrong with what's going on, at least not public. I'm, I'm assuming that behind closed doors, there's they sort of notice that things aren't really, really great. But it's just a little too rah, rah, rah. It's almost like a church revival meeting, and I'm just not into that kind of thing. And, and to me, it, it hurts a bit of their credibility. I want to know what the problems were and, they, and the acknowledgement of those problems before I'll believe their solutions. Closed captioning of Motoring 2008 is brought to you in part by Chevrolet Malibu Hybrid, the most affordable midsize hybrid in Canada. One thing I like about driving these new vehicles is you get to drive the ones that are fully loaded like the LE model. And one of the options it comes with is automatic windshield wipers. Now what you do, you set it on intermittent and then the wipers will sense the rain on the windshield and act accordingly. Now it may seem like a small thing, but you know it's one less thing you have to worry about when driving in these kinds of conditions. Another thing you really shouldn't have to worry about is that good old CVT transmission, which I've talked about a lot. But why don't we head to the Quaker State Garage, join Bill Gardner to learn more about the CVT. Brad, whenever we talk about CVTs or continuously variable transmissions, one of the first analogies we always make is the comparison of that to a snowmobile driveline. And the only real comparison is the fact that we've got infinitely variable gear ratios and we've got a drive and driven pulley as we have in a snowmobile driveline. Now in a snowmobile, uh, you use a rubber belt to connect those two pulleys that are always changing. And on a CVT transmission, we use a metal belt connecting those two. Now in a stepped ratio transmission, a conventional automatic transmission, we use planetary gear sets and we actually feel those gear ratio changes 
uh, you can actually feel the engine RPM changing every time those ratios change. And you know what? Most drivers kind of prefer that feel. And, and in the first generation of CVTs, you really didn't have that. And the knock on them was that when you went to full throttle acceleration for uh, launching the vehicle maybe, or for a passing situation, you had the engine RPM just flaring right to the red line, and then the vehicle kind of catching up to it as the vehicle accelerated up to speed. I know Graham didn't like them for that very reason. He talked about it on the show. He didn't like that trait, and a lot of other drivers didn't like that trait too. But the second generation now of CVT transmissions, Chrysler's into their generation too, and so is Nissan with the Murano. They've started to cure some of these negative traits to make them more appealing to drivers. But from a technical side, uh, the CVT transmission appeals to engineers because they can optimize those gear ratios constantly in order to get ring out the, the most fuel economy from the vehicle and the best drivability. So that's the appeal there. But you know, for me, when we're talking about transmission selection, just like engine, engine selection, when you're, you're picking a powertrain for that vehicle you're gonna buy, to me, the transmission and engine need to uh, suit the overall characteristics or the overall personality of the vehicle. So if I'm buying a sports car like a Corvette or any other sports car for that matter, I want a standard transmission. That's just how that vehicle should be to me. Now when it's a mainstream vehicle, maybe like a, an economy car, a mid-sized car, well, an automatic transmission's fine. And if a CVT gives me better fuel economy without sacrificing reliability and durability, I'm all for it. So, you know, it's got to suit the, suit the overall personality of the vehicle. Till next week, I'm Bill Gardner for Motoring 2008. Like the automobile industry, the airline business gets its share of new models and new technology every year. But unlike drivers, pilots do their entire training in a simulator before ever sitting on the flight deck of the actual plane. Although driving simulators have been around for many years, they've never been incorporated into mainstream driver education. Despite that, the technology continues to improve. At the recent Challenge of Abendum in Shanghai, China, Bosch and Toyota demonstrated simulators that actually include some of the new electronic systems found in today's vehicles. Uh, driving for a heck of a long time, uh, racing since uh, the mid-70s, and I think that was really the important part of my driving because it was through racing that I learned that driving is much more than just a way of going from point A to point B. It, it's a craft that we all need to develop further every single day. I'm a huge believer in simulators, even down to, as, to a, something as, as low as a, uh, like a Sony PlayStation. When you play video games, as funny as it sounds, you are actually learning a lot of important driving techniques. The better the quality of the simulator, the more you learn. And it can be a huge saving because it's a lot easier to make a mistake on a simulator than in real life. A simulator, you reset the game and you start over. In real life, you may not have that option. A good example is if you take a 16-year-old driver, say in a high school education class, and they go out to drive for the first time, if an emergency pops up, they're gonna do the worst possible thing nine times out of 10. If they're in a simulator, the instructor can be standing beside them and say, stop right there, here is what you did wrong, here's what you should do. And then you go, ah. I would like to make the point that it cannot just be the car itself, it's also got to be uh, the driver in terms of greater awareness and it's also got to be the road infrastructure. What we're going to have is increasingly smart cars, uh, smart roads, let's hope we have smart drivers as well. So who was Ruben Smead? Well, it turns out he was a mathematics genius back in the 1940s and 50s, and he postulated something that's come to be known as Smead's Law. And this says that the fatality rate on highways and traffic actually decreases as the number of cars increases. Now, this is counterintuitive. You figured the more cars, the better chance they'd run into each other. It's probably true, the old joke that the first crash in any country occurs when the second car is licensed, they run into each other. And it is true that as countries motorize, they have more and more crashes until they reach a certain plateau, and then they start to drop off. Now, it doesn't seem to matter whether the country was motorized in the early 1900s, like France, or in the 1930s, like Germany, 
or even in the 50s and 60s, places like Mexico. 30 years ago, Mexico City was a complete disaster traffic-wise. Nowadays, it's still pretty chaotic, but it's much more civilized than it was. Smead theorized that drivers will accept a certain level of risk. They'll tolerate a certain amount of danger. When it gets more and more dangerous, as traffic gets denser and denser, they start driving smarter. And the statistics tend to bear them out. Now, the situation we're all looking at now, of course, is China, the country that's developing the fastest on the motorized world right now. They kill something like 100,000 people every year on the roads in China, and yet they have relatively few cars. Now, they're expecting to have five times as many cars over the next 20 years. Does that mean they're going to kill half a million people a year? Fortunately, Professor Smead says that's not going to happen. Well, let's all meet in Beijing in 20 years and find out if he was right. I'm Jim Kenzie. You know, no doubt Nissan was disappointed to have to unveil their new Nissan Murano in beautiful, rainy Arizona, but they'll have a lot more opportunities. You know, this vehicle was first sold only in North America when it debuted in 2003. It is now sold in 130 countries. What do I think of the new one? Well, from a styling point of view, I think they all kind of look the same in this segment, but having said that, it's an improvement over the previous model. Great driving, nice and quiet on the highway, 265 horsepower, lots of power, although again, I'm an old guy, I'm just not big on this CVT transmission, but having said that, it's been very successful. So maybe I should leave selling cars to Nissan and continue doing what I'm doing, whatever that is. Anyway, that's it for now. We'll see you next time out as we continue to bring you more stories about cars and the people who drive them. The Chinese government is very interested, obviously, in improving uh, not only the status of the safety of its civilians, but also they're looking to perhaps leapfrog, in a technology sense, what's happening with the cars here. The, the pollution is, is apparent. Uh, they are very interested in how to deal with it, and I think you know, the Challenge Babendum, among other venues here, is going to help them come up with some solutions that, that perhaps can lead to a better, better situation. Motoring 2008 on TSN has been brought to you by the new Q Horsepower from Quaker State. Unleash all your horses and Michelin, a better way forward.